Uh, welcome to uh, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. This is our uh, water distribution lesson. And I know we, we have other lessons that you do that talk um, completely about Montana. This lesson is just a little bit different because we're talking about the waters of the world because the water we have in Montana, which is important to our fish, doesn't stay in the state borders. It doesn't just stop at one side of Montana and end at the other side. Our water runs all the way through the world. So we're going to be talking about waters of the world today. Um, now just a little bit of a review. I know most of you have probably already had, had some uh, science lessons on the water cycle. And you re remember that the water cycle is how our water gets all the way through the world. And our water comes down in uh, forms of precipitation, rain, snow, sleet, ice, combination. It comes down to the Earth's surface, and it then is contained in many different contain ways of containing. Now, if we look at the, at the globe, we can see that if you look at a globe that you have one at your house or you have one in school, um, Blue is usually what represents the water. And if you look at that water that we have around the world, there's a lot of blue on this globe, just a whole bunch of blue. And the scientists tell us that 71% approximately of the Earth is some type of water. And there's many different, contain I like to kind of call them containers, that hold that water. And the water comes down in, in our water cycle from precipitation, and it might fall into the ocean or it might fall into one of the other containers, goes through evaporation, condensation, into the clouds, and then when the clouds become so saturated with ice particles, it then starts it all over again. And so that's kind of how our water kind of circulates throughout the whole world. Um, in Montana, if we look just at well, let's see, where are we here in Montana? We, if I can find the United States, here we are. We're right, we're right here. In Montana, our water, um, the water cycle kind of begins for us in the mountains, in the Rocky Mountains. And the water comes down on either side of the Rocky Mountains. Most of it uh, is on the eastern side of the Rocky Mountains. And it comes down and it flows into the Missouri River, which runs through Montana. And the Missouri River, which is the longest river in the United States, we have that going for us. It starts at Three Forks. And then it flows down across Montana, across North Dakota, into South Dakota, Nebraska. And it eventually meets the Mississippi River. And then in the Mississippi River, that flows down all the way down into the Gulf of Mexico and into the, into the ocean. And then it begins the water cycle all over again. So that's kind of why we're talking about waters of the world, because our water doesn't just stay right here in, in Montana. Now, we have different places in the world that hold the water. And we just, we've talked about one of them, or two of them right here. We've talked about oceans. I want you to just kind of think about that. We've talked about oceans. And I talked about rivers. And when we talk about rivers today, we're going to be including in rivers streams and creeks and any type of water that's a flowing type of water. Now, if you kind of stop and think about another type of water or area, surface that holds water on the earth, for me, because I came from Minnesota, I always think of lakes, land of 10,000 lakes. So that's one of our other places that holds our water and the surface for us. Um, some other places that might hold water, and lakes we're also going to consider ponds. Uh, I had a student one time ask me if a mud puddle would be considered part of that, and I said, well, if it's big enough until it dries up, I guess it would be. But so we've got oceans, we've got rivers, we've got lakes. So if you can think of some other places that might hold water. Um, what about ice caps? Ice in general. And we have ice caps, and we have glaciers. Basically, large areas of ice that, that don't melt, 
year, they're kind of there year round. So we've got those. And um, another thing that we, we don't think about a whole lot, but how many of you have a well? I know in Montana, a lot of people have wells at their house for watering their lawn, or if you live out on a ranch. Um, I grew up on a farm and we had a well, and that's what we used to um, get our water from and water the lawn and the gardens and livestock. So that water that comes from the, from the ground and into our wells, we call groundwater because it's basically under the surface of the earth. And it's interesting to think there's a lot of different sources of, of groundwater. We have in Montana and in Wyoming, the famous ones are in Old Faithful in Yellowstone National Park, our geysers. Those are all groundwater. So we have groundwater. We also have, let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five. We have clouds or the atmosphere. They hold water also. So this, these are the kind of the containers, our Earth's containers of water that hold the water that we have all around the world. And for today, um, I ha have this jar here. It's called Earth's Water. And this is going to represent for us all the water of the world. And the activity that I'm going to do today, you can do yourself at home. You'll just need to have some glasses or some jars. I was thinking even if you had like a canning jar or kept your jelly jars or water bottles, uh, clear ones, you could use those to do this same activity at home. Now, our Earth's water goes into these uh, six surface holders or water holders, but they don't all hold the same amount. They hold a different amounts. And we're going to kind of talk about how much they hold, and then we're going to kind of discover exactly how much they hold. Now, I know that if you were here, I'd be asking you to take, I have containers that have all of these things labeled, all of our different places labeled. And if you do this activity in your classroom, or if you do it with a friend, or even if you do it, you could do it at your house with your parents, have everybody kind of make uh, an observation or an educated guess as to what ones they think hold the most down to what you think holds the least. Now, because I can't hear you right now, I'm just going to have to kind of tell you the order that, they, that it goes in. And I know that you right away you're going to guess that oceans holds the most. We'll put that one over there. Oceans hold, hold the most amount of water. Um, and you can, by looking at our globe, you can see that the oceans, we have a lot of oceans. And our, in our oceans, we're basically going to include anything that's a salt water. So we can have seas in there. Uh, we do have uh, one saltwater lake in the United States. And so we have, we have that, that included in our, in our oceans. Anything with salt water is going to be oceans. Now, what holds this, the next most amount. We'll cross off oceans because there we'll put that up. We have that. That's number one. Okay, the next one. Did you take a guess? And it's okay if you're wrong because in scientists, we're, we're wrong a lot. We just have to keep doing things. Ice caps and glaciers hold the next highest amount. And people say, well, water? They, they don't have water. They're ice. Well, if you melted all that water, what would you, or all that ice, what would you get? You would get water. Now stop and think about the glaciers that we have in the world, and then think about we have a continent made of ice. And in the center of that continent, when the scientists drill to see how deep it is, they can't measure it in inches or feet or yards. It's actually measured in miles, and it's close to five miles thick. So that is a lot of ice. So our, our um, continent and our glaciers hold the second highest amount of water. Now next, this is another one. What do you guys think it's going to be? OK, ask, your, ask your, your friends or your family, whoever you're doing this with. Maybe ask your teacher if you're in your classroom. 
Next one is groundwater. And that's another one that people go, groundwater, really? It can have that much water in it? Well, did you know we have aquifers, we have rivers and lakes underneath the ground? It's not just our well water. We actually have rivers and lakes that are under the ground. We can't see them. Think about Old Faithful, how much water has to be there for it to go off. I think it's like every 55, 59 minutes. And it spurts up a tremendous amount of, of water every time. And think of all the other geysers all around the world. Um, right here in Billings, we have um, rivers that run from where our rims are all the way down to the Yellowstone River. And people who live in that area who dig wells, which we did, we got a well at 15 feet deep because the groundwater was so high and there was so much groundwater. The well, it, it, it was fun for the kids to run in the sprinkler in because it had a lot of shooting power to it. Um, so, and then there's places where there isn't very much groundwater. But there is a lot throughout the world. So what's going to be next? What do you think? Lakes is going to be our, oh, yeah, lakes and ponds. Our lakes and ponds is going to be the next one. Now, think of, um, in Montana, we don't have a whole lot of lakes. Groundwater was three, lakes are four. And most of our lakes are small. They're not real deep. If you think of some of our mountain lakes, they're not real deep. Our reservoirs are deep, um, and they hold a lot of water. But think of your um, geography. Uh, think of the Great Lakes in the northern, northeastern part of America. Those lakes are so deep, just here in America, they can actually take uh, cruise ships on them. They can have tankers where they haul uh, grain, iron ore, uh, cars, anything that they want to haul, the big container ships. That, so there is a lot of water in those lakes. And Minnesota on itself has 10,000 lakes. So lakes is number four. Now, we have two left. And I know what one everybody in Montana is going to think is number five. And I don't think you're going to be right. Number five is clouds. Now, think about clouds. And clouds is going to include all of our atmosphere and our air. Now, look at that globe again. All around the whole Earth is atmosphere. And it, it, the atmosphere is full of moisture. It's full of clouds. They, that has water in it. And so there's just a lot of uh, water in our atmosphere making our clouds, and then it rains or it snows. So that's number five. Number six is our rivers. And I know that for our kids in Montana, this one is kind of the difficult one. And they'll say, oh, Mrs. Anderson, no. We have so many rivers. How can the rivers be last? And I, and I say, well, stop and think about a river. Think about the rivers around where you live in the spring. They're very deep. There's a lot of runoff from the mountains, from the snow that's melting, and they fill up. And they're, they run very fast. They're very high. They hold lots of water. But then stop and think about what they begin to look like the end of August and September when there's no more runoff for them. They begin to dry up. They get very shallow. And some of our rivers and streams do actually completely dry up. So they're not a consistent holder of water or container of water. They have a lot in their springs and not so much in their falls. So this is the order of our, of our surface holders or undersurface holders, ground surface holders of water, our containers, our water containers on the earth. Oceans, ice and glaciers, groundwater, then our lakes and ponds, then our clouds and our atmosphere, and the rivers and our streams hold the least amount. And our water, Earth's water, is divided up into these six containers. Now, it's not divided up equally. They do not, we know that oceans obviously are going to hold more than rivers, 
but there still is a lot of division between those. They're not, they don't hold like uh, a divided amount of water in them. So I'm going to divide them up and um, then we'll, we'll, go, we'll talk about that a little bit. I'm going to start with oceans because oceans, as number one, it is going to hold the most. And I can put water in oceans and I can come back and add more or take some out, do whatever I want when I'm finished. Now I want, I want to tell you that this is not something that I've made up. This is scientific. And um, every once in a while I go back online and I Google the waters of the world and see what holds the most and what's the comparison and it hasn't really changed yet. So um, this is factual, as close to being factual. I'm not using actual measuring, but it's as close as we could get it and it's going to give us a really good idea of how much each of our surface or earth containers of water holds. Okay, in the ice, which is second, I want to put, and you might want to think about this when you're doing your containers, I'm going to put about half an inch. Yep, just about half an inch of the water. If I, if I put about half an inch of my uh, earth's water in there, that is about what it holds compared to everything else. So then I'm going to take a look at the groundwater. Groundwater, I just want to cover the bottom. This is kind of a hard one for me to do because sometimes I get too much. Yep, my bottom, the bottom of it is all completely covered. But as you can see, it's less quite a bit less than my ice. Now my lakes, I'm going to do, it, it would be like about 10 drops, but what I'm going to do is just um, a splash. It's actually about a whole teaspoonful if you want to use measuring spoons, but just a splash, yep. You can see, can you see that in the bottom there? If I turn it sideways, that's about how much it is. Doesn't quite cover the whole, the, the whole bottom but there's like a good splash in there, and it's actually about a teaspoonful of water. Now, for clouds. Clouds, I can't really pour. So um, I'm going to have to use my hand. I guess I should have had a towel. And what I'm going to put in, in, in this one, is I'm going to put 10 drops in. So you can kind of count while I do this. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, and I actually, yes, thank you. I actually, when I did this at home once, I thought, well, I'm just going to see how much this would be in, in a teaspoon. So um, I put my 10 drops in, and then I put it into a teaspoon, and it's about a quarter of a teaspoon. But if you can see it right down there in that corner, that's kind of why I do the water blue. It's easier to see. That's 10 drops, and that's our clouds as compared to the, our other sources of water. Now, rivers and streams which hold the least. I cannot even do rivers and streams accurately because rivers and streams in accurate comparison to our other surface containers would be one-tenth of one drop. Now there's no way I can divide up one-tenth of one drop so I'm just gonna have to have one, there we go, one drop in that one. And if you can, I don't know if you can kind of see it right there, it's kind of rolling around. Can you see that a little bit? Just kind of, it rolls around in there. And that, that is our one drop. Now, you're going to say, well, you've got all that water left. Where does it go? Well, it all goes into oceans.
all of the water goes back into oceans. Okay, now we've we have divided up our water, and we know that oceans has quite a bit more than, than the rest of our, of our Earth's surface containers. Now we have to get to kind of the nitty gritty as to how we're going to use the water. And it, it's going to go into two categories, usable and unusable. Usable water is water that we can use as human beings for our life. We use it to hydrate ourselves. We use it to uh, grow food, plants, and vegetables. And then, of course, for our trees and grass, for oxygen in the world, we use it to grow livestock and to feed our animals. And so if it's not usable for those things to maintain human's life, we consider it to be unusable. So let's start first with our ocean water. Do you think it's usable or unusable? It is unusable. Why? Because the ocean water is salt water. We cannot use it to hydrate our bodies. There are a few plants that you can grow that grow in the oceans, but not necessarily enough plants to for for growing food. And it really doesn't take very much salt water or to, to kill a plant, particularly in a garden or, or crops that you're growing. So ocean water is unusable. We can't drink it. Uh, if you were in a life raft, say you were on a cruise and the ship sunk and you're on a life raft in the middle of the ocean, if you did not drink the ocean water, you would last longer without drinking the ocean water. So it's unusable. Ice, ice is fresh water. It is fresh water, but it is unusable. And my students will say, but Mrs. Anderson, it's fresh water. Yeah, but it's not accessible. Can we get it from the glaciers to grow our food, to feed our livestock? Nope. If it melts, it goes into the oceans, and it becomes ocean water, which is salty. So it is unusable. Groundwater, usable or unusable? Groundwater is our largest source of usable water. Remember we talked about the wells, people who have wells. How many of you have wells? That is usable water. We can drink it. We can use it to grow food. We can use it to give to our, our uh, livestock. So our groundwater is our largest source of usable water. Lakes. Lakes and ponds. It's fresh water, just like our groundwater, so it is usable. Uh, it may have to be treated a little bit, um, but it is it is usable water. And in uh, there are many cities, particularly cities that we talked about, the Great Lakes in America. These cities that are located upon on the Great Lakes, they run their whole water systems with water from the lakes. It runs through a treatment center, and then they can drink it. OK, next we have clouds, usable or unusable. When it comes down as rain and snow and sleet, it's fresh water. But is it usable? No, we can't drink it. We can't use it to until it hits one of these containers uh, on the earth. We can't use it to feed our livestock, so it is not accessible on a regular basis to be usable. OK, rivers and streams, usable or unusable? In Montana, this is our most usable water. That one little drop, I think it's going in there. Uh, hasn't made it yet, but we'll say it did. It is usable water. Um, Many of our cities, actually most of our cities in Montana, are, have been built along rivers. Why? Because they had access to water. Do you, once again, does it have to run through a treatment center? A little bit of treatment center, but it's not an expensive uh, process. So this is what we have, unusable, and this is usable. 
Now I'm going to say something about the ocean water, the salination, the salt in it. I know that there are, there's processes going on now where they're trying to desalinate the water, and they can do it. Uh, there's, I think, t uh, one or two plants, one for sure in California, and there's, a, there's several of them in the Middle East where they're really short of water. The only thing is the process to desalinate it is so expensive that you're a water bottle that you would get, like one for 99 cents, 89 cents at the store, that much desalinated water would cost about $9. And then in Montana, think of how far away we are from any of the oceans. The cost to desalinate it and haul it here would make it not feasible for us to grow our food and feed our livestock. So as of yet, maybe someday one of you will figure out a less expensive way, it's not usable. Now, so we have this much of our water in the world, which is actually 96.7% of the water in the world, and 3.3% usable. 96.7% unusable, 3.3% usable. Now, do we get new water? Can we get new water? Nope, we can't. We have all the water that we have had since the beginning of time. The water, remember we talked about the water cycle at the very beginning? The water just keeps running back through that water cycle. And so we've had all the water that we've had since the dinosaurs were here. You may have taken a bath or shower this morning in the same water that dinosaurs swam in. I like to think that maybe I took a, a shower in water that Queen Cleopatra took a shower or bath in because it just makes me feel kind of good. I have a friend who likes to think he brushes his teeth with uh, w water that George Washington wash brushed his teeth in. So we don't get any new water. We have all the water that we've had. Do we lose water? Well, unfortunately, we do. We can lose it to contamination. We can lose it to pollution. We also have to consider the number of people we have on the Earth Right now, um, I'm gonna, this is why I've got to check because I want to, yep, I was right. 7.8 billion people on the earth now as compared to um, thousands of years ago. And so we as human beings use more water. So this is just kind of a quick lesson on learning about our earth waters, the places that it's stored in, when it comes to the earth, and how much of our water is actually usable and how much is unusable. Now, remember I said you can do this lesson at home yourself. You could would be a great lesson to show your parents. Do it in your classroom with your classmates. You just need some clear containers and just kind of divide up your water in about the same method. And I always have to, when I'm done with this lesson, go have a nice big drink of water. So thank you for listening today, and can't wait to see you again at our next Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks Aquatic Education lesson. Thank you. Mm -hmm.